Hello everyone, I'm Ben Coleman, one of your hosts here for the Florida Aviation Network, and we're transmitting, broadcasting, and absolutely live here in the terminal building of Sebring Regional Airport. And uh, we're here for a little event called the Sport Aviation Expo. Bob Nacero was waiting for me to choke on that. He does every time. He's one of our volunteers running behind camera one. And uh, don't catch me on this one. Not this time, Bob. Uh, but, you know, we're here at Sebring, and every year we like to come. Uh, this is 2019. And we like to explore th all the different nuances that happen to come down the pike and some olances. I just made that one up. Yeah, Bob, I made that one up for you. An olance. The, uh, but Sebring Flight Academy. And uh, we happen to have somebody that knows a little bit about the Flight Academy here, Mr. Brant Howell. Brant? Yes, sir. Good, good to have to be, you here. Good to be here. Good to be here. Yes. Tell us a little bit about uh, Sebring Flight Academy and how that fits into the sport aviation scenario. Sure. Um, it's, it's a fairly new concept for us here, man. Um, we'd had a, a flight school here for a, a number of years. And actually, because of the expo last year here at this location, uh, we became connected with and partnered up with uh, Bristol Aircraft. And it's been a wonderful union ever since then. Um, we are able to kind of offer some things here uh, specific, not just to sport training, but for the more advanced ratings all the way through commercial multi-engine here mm. uh, with some accelerated packages to meet the needs of the pilot shortage that we've all heard so much about out there. Uh, and that includes housing for our cadets, that includes financing uh, for our cadets in really modern, uh, technically advanced aircraft, which is the uh, Bristol aircraft, mm -hmm. okay? Have you been tracking, uh, well, have you been tracking? I'm sure you track your, uh, your students and uh, your graduates and where they go in their, in their course of aviation career. Uh, do you uh, have some success stories to share with me of folks that cut their teeth here with you guys? And sure. Uh, Here's one of the, the first things that uh, we're really excited about. And with our program, um, as we all know, one of the biggest uh, drawbacks or, or uh, downfalls of flight training is money. Okay. So as a light sport instructor, you are, um, you are able to obtain an instructor certificate with only 150 total hours. Mm. Okay, teaching light sport uh, mm -hmm. uh, certificates. So we have a young cadet who uh, who had his private pilot license, and uh, he's come down to the program. He's staying with us here, and he is taking his check ride next week for his light sport certificate instructor's license. Mm -hmm. Okay. What that allows to happen at this point here is we will give him a job. He will be employed by Sebring Flight Academy. Okay. So as he is building his resume, as he is building his uh, flight time, he's also making a living, taking some earnings, okay? And as he does that, he gains the experience. He's mentored through the process and everything. So uh, reaching that magical 1,500 hours that everybody uh, is needed here for an ATP here mm -hmm. is offset with the cost or, or with, the, um, with the benefit of having an income to generate as you're doing that. With that, we've also partnered uh, uh, with uh, several airlines that we have, uh, we're able to offer them interviews if that's the direction they want to go in there. At a cost that is really, um, really just a fraction of what uh, the industry is, is um, charging elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're advertising uh, a program from zero to uh, your ATP level for $55,000. Mm. Okay. That's that sounds like a lot of money. However, if you're out doing some price shopping, do some do some homework. Do some homework, absolutely yeah. on that. Okay, yeah. and the 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 reason we're able to do that is um, our partnership with Burstell. Um Just a marvelous aircraft. Uh, uh, the maintenance costs on that are a fraction of what it would take to operate a, a conventional 172. Um, so the fuel burns and all those things allow us to put that package together for, for half of what somebody else is charging out there. Yep. Brent, what is the compromise to safety for that savings? Absolutely none. No, no compromise. If anything, 
uh, the new aircraft with uh, ADSB in and out, uh, weather on board, traffic, it's just it's just a complete package there. Yeah. But if I'm a flight school, a 141 school, flying conventional Part 23 aircraft, and uh, I hate you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm afraid we're going to get a lot of that. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, I hate yes. you. Yes. Uh, yes. But yes. I love you from uh, an, an, an aviation entity standpoint, from the industry standpoint, we love you. Because well, you know, that's the whole concept between this light sport and the sport aviation movement is to make it more affordable, to get more people in. And a lot of folks say, the, the, they heard you here say it's $55,000. Well, they probably about choked or fainted or swallowed their tongue because that's a lot of money. Not if you go out and price it out at the schools because some of the other schools are anywhere from 130000 150000 up to 300000 for that same equipment. Absolutely. And you have to keep in mind that even at that 55,000, um, these young cadets are being paid as instructors mm -hmm. with only 150 hours of, of total time there. Mm -hmm. Now, some might say, well, you know, an instructor with 150 hours is a little intimidating, but um, we've learned and I've learned uh, a lifetime in this industry that there is nothing better than a homegrown instructor. Mm -hmm. And we're able to mentor these young, young folks and um, really mold them into um, not somebody who's, uh, you know, just in, in the game to build time, so mm -hmm. to speak. Okay. Well, and uh, you can't get experience in a pill form, and you can't read it no, to you get can't. it. you got to get it. No, and one of the things that I, uh, that I admire about uh, the flight training industry is uh, people want to get in fast airplanes. People want to go fast. Well, no, to get flight experience, you want to go slow. The slower you can go, the better. It's the more bang for your buck the more opportunity you're going to get to hurt yourself in an airplane that you have to figure out what not to do and leave yourself options. Absolutely. Don't paint yourself into a corner. And uh, it happens the same way in a Bristol as it does in a 172 or a Seneca or a Malibu or any of the higher performance aircraft. You paint yourself in a corner. Absolutely. So you learn on the bottom, the foundation, with your school and uh, schools like yours. How many others are doing what you're doing here, uh, Brandon? You know, it, it's so novel um, that uh, I'd have to honestly answer right now, I'm not aware of any that have this specific business model that, that mm -hmm. we're operating under here. Um, there are, you know, different ways uh, for, for young folks to, uh, to, uh, to get funding for flight training, but this is an in-house um, uh, program here that is very flexible in terms of payback on it not at credit card kind of rates that type of thing a very affordable way of doing things mm -hmm. okay and the bristel and uh, some people call it a bristol uh, they bristol, normally butcher sure. the name but it's, sure. it's a bristol uh what is the lineage of that aircraft where did it come from what's its design concept uh, sure it's a it's a low wing all metal airplane um the concept is from milan bristol um, who was a, a big part of developing the Sport Cruiser from Piper. Um, it's built in the Czech Republic, and then uh, it is assembled up in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, here uh, in Pennsylvania. And uh, we just took delivery of two of them this month here in uh, Sebring here. Okay. Has that new airplane smell in them when they well, it has actually a new airplane smell and that new airplane performance to it. Yes. And actually, I don't, most all the Brestels basically have that new airplane smell because. They're all basically new. They're low time. What's the highest time Bristol that you know of? Uh, 1,400 hours in that range there. 14,000 hours? 1,400. 1,400 hours. Yep. Okay. Yep. What are they going to look like when they get 14,000 hours on them? Well, that's that's a good question. Um, you know, we could ask the same question out of a Cessna 172 or a Cherokee. Mm -hmm. I think we've uh, eliminated a lot of the, um, the pitfalls that might have occurred with that. And when you look at uh, when things really go wrong with them, it's in the landing phase and damage to the landing gear. We've got a different approach to teaching our cadets landings in, in these light sport aircraft, which is so critical here. Um, and it's really going to be a big uh, savings and maintenance cost and downtimes on the airplane there. Power on approaches, different techniques. Um, We've actually developed a, uh, a coin that these young guys are awarded when they meet certain criteria for accuracy, um, crosswind corrections, and those types of things. And it's kind of a nice, um, a nice boost for them to kind of have something to shoot for here. To land on the center line, sh you know, is a is a good warm feeling when you do, can do it consistently. What a novel concept! Yep. Uh, yep. Always when I'm flying with folks and uh, and up there, 
doing the fly and said, why don't you land in the center of the runway? Well, I am on the center of the runway. Well, no, see that little line there? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's the yeah. center. Well, but why? He says, well, because. That's what it's there for. Absolutely. It's a target. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. And yes. if so it goes wrong, it gives you equal amounts of thing uh, of room to get it back to under control. Corrections, yeah. yeah, yeah. And for the uh, f for things that um, require just procedural stuff, um, there is no better platform, in my opinion, than the Redbird Simulator. Mm. Emergency procedures, crosswind techniques. Um, it's just uh, you know the things that we can do in there is is only limited by your imagination, really. And, and if we had B-roll going in the background, we'd have a picture of the Redbird simulator uh, running in the background. But we're going to force our viewers to uh, to go online and check out and check the Redbird out. simulator. A absolutely, yes. Just Google Redbird simulator. Or, or actually, I'm sure on your website it's uh, it's popular. It, it on there. is. We have some videos and some links with that. It's completely a, a modular system, so we can go from a, a six-pack uh, configured airplane right to the most modern glass G1000 equipped airplanes. Now, We're to some of our viewers that don't aren't familiar with the term six-pack or steam gauges, yeah. explain <laughs> that to yeah, us a little yeah. bit. So those are the uh, the round gauges that a lot of us old-timers kind of grew up with there. Hey, uh, you're uh, looking yeah, at me yes, when you say that? Uh, absolutely, huh? and I'm looking at myself. <laughs> so, uh, But there uh, there is some benefit to uh, developing a scan and those types of things for the instrument world, so we still like to at least incorporate that into some of the uh, initial training so you know uh, these cadets understand what a vacuum pump is and, and how these things all kind of interplay together well I still like the fuel gauge of a wire hanging up with a with a bend over at the tip nothing better than a visual <laughs> visual check of it there sure but no I'm a little old-fashioned but that's okay because some of the new technology it, it really does enhance safety it, in our industry. It, it does. does. It does. And that, that is really at the crux of what we're developing here, is getting back to some good, solid, basic stick and rudder skills, understand what's going on underneath the hood of the airplane, um, and, and just uh, making a, a complete package, a complete pilot here. Well, and uh, Brant, a little bit about you. We were, before we went on the air, uh, I was trying to get in and delve into your background a little bit of what gave you this this obvious passion sure. for the sport aviation. Sure. Uh, my dad, uh, I grew up l learning how to fly on his lap. He was an old Allegheny Airlines guy, which became U.S. Air. Um, very fortunate to have a, uh, a little grass strip up in Pennsylvania that we used to take our family vacations out of in a Cherokee 6. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I developed a real love for general aviation. Um, I was primed to follow in his footsteps and go into the airlines. Um, experimented, did some of that, some 135 stuff, but I've always found my real, my real passion, my real um, drive. The reason I get up in the morning is uh, is flight training, and, and we've been doing it a long time. Well, Brent, you're uh, you suffer from the same basic disease that I have, is because uh, I came up similar. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't know any better. We don't know what it is. It's uh, <laughs> b because this is such a fun industry, yeah. uh, and uh, you probably haven't really worked hard a day in your life. Not since uh, uh, yeah, maybe one or two. Okay, sure. All right, well, <laughs> sure, some sure. of those approaches down to the skinny and uh, down and into the weeds. Go around yeah, and, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. but uh, but the really when you look back at it, that might have been a lot of work and you know, a little bit of sweat coming off the brow, little uh, buttonhole uh, seat uh, matters. But when you look back at it, it was good experience and you learned from it. And it gave you confidence, so Absolutely. it really wasn't a bad day because you're sitting no. here talking with us. No, nope. so. and just as a side note, there, uh, I got a phone call from a student that uh, got his license, which probably been 25 years ago, and uh, we stay in touch a little bit over the years. But he says, "Brant, I had my first engine failure." And I said, "Oh, how'd that work out?" He said, "The first thing I heard was your voice: fly the airplane, fly the airplane." Successfully made an off-field landing in it, walked away. And uh, that was just one of those moments that you say, yeah, maybe we, maybe we make a difference out there. So, know, that, so I take it that was a single-engine airplane. That was a single-engine okay. airplane, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> when you first said that, it came back to mind. You've heard about the, uh, the dreaded, en the dreaded engine-out approach? Oh, yes. In a B-52? Uh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, engine-out coming into approach, ATC. Uh, engine-out, uh, November so-and-so, so -and -so, come here, flight so-and-so. And I -so. said, uh, well, Okay, uh, climb, maintain, such and such, heading to, uh, we're engine out, sir. Well, you've got seven more, don't you? So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, little little joke, but anyway. Understood, yes. So, we always have to qualify uh, when we what have type engine, of out, engine out. Kind of, yes, but, no, that's good, yes, and that's yeah. a big decision to make, uh, having to put it down in the field. But, 
they made the decision and uh, hear him hearing you fly the plane that was very fly the plane, rewarding fly very the plane. rewarding yep absolutely uh, and yes. hopefully as he goes in, into his multi-engine phase of his training it's so much more important absolutely <laughs> Because uh, you get the head down, wrapped up in the cockpit, and uh, just lose f fight of fly the plane. Absolutely. You now have a glider. Yes, <laughs> yes. And the, the ability to do that in that Redbird, and, uh, you know, we can control all those parameters um, exterior of the airplane, and uh, you still get, you know, inst instead of the old put a cover over an instrument here or simulate it, they mm -hmm. get that shock value in mm -hmm. it. And we want to make sure that, they're, that they follow the procedures and their checklists, and uh, that's what it's all about. Brent, the uh, I, I, I don't want to hound you on this cost factor, but I do want to get the most mileage out of it Absolutely. because there might be somebody sitting here realizing that, wow, that's somewhat affordable. Uh, what does that package give them? They come out, they, they spit out the other side with an ATP? They spit out the other side with an ATP. As Absolutely. long as they're old enough. Yes, as long as they're old enough. And, and what is that magic age? Uh, we like to have them at 23. Mm -hmm. um, our ideal cadet is going to be in the 19 to 20-year-old uh, range here. Um, not to say that uh, somebody considerably older can't do that. Um, uh, but if we're going to finance it long-term on everything there, we'd like to see them to get into uh, into the system as quick as possible because the way the, the, the uh, finance is actually structured is a bulk of it isn't even uh, due to be paid back until you achieve your first job with an airline or corporate job, making $100,000 a year. So we're not greedy to get a return on that money from day one. Now, wait a minute. Okay. You just mentioned financing. I'm talking about flight training. Uh, you mean I don't have to come up with $55,000 to sign up for your course? Absolutely not. Absolutely what, not. What requirements do you ask for or, or expect a person of good character um, you know obviously we're gonna uh, do a, a routine normal credit check that somebody else would come for mm -hmm. uh, we want a commitment to them to follow through through the program so there will be uh, screening with myself there to uh, um, you know we don't want tire, tire kickers we want somebody who's driven maybe has demonstrated uh, um, their passion for it here by having the written test done, having a good knowledge base of things there. But other than that, any any walk of life, male, female, shape, sizes, that makes absolutely no difference. That's yep. interesting. And, that, and uh, now I understand why your program is so unique. Absolutely. Because that's uh, something that you don't, I mean, there's other organizations that may offer a, uh, a finance program, but you got to put considerable money up front uh, for collateral, if you will, absolutely. In case you, uh, you know, and Sally and uh, and Johnny uh, may be hot and cold, and mom and dad wants them to get involved with something, so they have to fork out the twenty five, thirty thousand up front, and uh, if that way, if they lose interest, then they lose their investment. Absolutely. And, and really, all we, all's we ask on this here is if somebody that is interested, we have a whole um, finance department there that can um, really customize a, a package to someone's specific needs here. Um, mm. You know, so, uh, you know, of course, are there folks that want to put money down? We'd be happy to take that, but that is not a prerequisite at all. No. Is, uh, are there incentives for those who do have funds that they want to put up, up front? <laughs> there is, and, and again, it's customizable there. Um, you know, there are block time rates that get you reduced costs on the airplanes and instructors over time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because I would yeah. encourage anybody to, uh, and again, to show that good foot forward, uh, that good faith uh, investment to be able to put down a little bit uh, to show that they've got some skin in the game other than just a And, and that's, that's been the norm for many years. Um, the skin in the game that we want to see for them is the commitment, as I say, um, when we sit down and talk to them, um, they can say they come in with a library of books and we can see that there's been some initiative on their part there. Yep. How about housing? You mentioned housing and so forth. Where do you put up your cadets? Wonderful house, uh, about four miles from the airport here. Uh, it's a home that we purchased that was literally just remodeled from the slab up. Um, full kitchen, uh, garage, um, uh, laundry room. Uh, we can accommodate it up to about eight students uh, in the house mm -hmm. at a time there. Uh, very convenient and uh, just a nice place to, uh, to stay. 
No. Okay. Now you mentioned eight students. What is your uh, what is your target? And I'm sure you want growth with every business. You try to project growth. But what would you what would be your ideal class size or actually enrollment now? Uh, and where do you want to be? Where you, where can you be? Sure, you like? sure. Where we can be, um, and, and this is one of the the, the really beautiful things of uh, have having partnered here with Bristol, is the airplanes are available. Um, it's really as simple as uh, calling up Lou um, Mancuso, who's the importer of, of Bristol, and saying, Lou, I've got a, a, a class of five people starting here. I think we're going to need an a another airplane. Okay. Um, they will literally have an airplane down here for us uh, in a week's time here. So there's no limit initially on, uh, on resources here uh, airplane-wise. What we have to kind of address here will be uh, instructor availability. And uh, I think we've got that initiative. There was a time when I could hold on to instructor for two years. Mm -hmm. that, that's not the case anymore, of course, okay? But I think with, uh, with the model we've got, where they're generating an income early, where they're flying modern aircraft that are going to be very similar to what they're going to be flying in the future there, our retention will be much better than that. Okay. Well, how do I put this? Uh, I guess I'll just, <laughs> I'll just put just it, blunt. I'll just spit it out, out there. Yeah. About old timers. I mean, uh, would you take in some old timer flight instructors after they meet your criteria, of course? fly with them, like them, mannerism, uh, if they're good instructors or not, because there are a lot of instructors out there that may not be the best. Uh, so uh, would that, but that would kind of put a ripple in your uh, in-house flight instruction cadre. Uh, not necessarily, and we would embrace the older guys, um, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. uh, with that comes, you know, the... Uh, the longevity, the the, uh, the fact that we know they're going to be around for a couple of years there. Mm -hmm. um, I think there will be enough uh, to go around where they won't be impeding on, on the younger guys there. Um, so the older guys we found um, uh, are, are sought after because we also do transition training mm -hmm. and those types of guys looking into the sport thing. They would have a, a, a fit for that type of thing also. Okay. Well, I, just, I just had a brainstorm. Mm -hmm. Brent had a brainstorm. Why don't you find a cadre of uh, guys and gals with a lot of flight instruction experience that are either retired or sunsetted or kind of gotten out of it, got the T-shirt, and be able to pull them in on occasion when you needed them. Yes. And that way they will probably volunteer their time to you. I'm working on two out here as we speak. Oh, that we so I'm expo. not the first one that came <laughs> yeah, up with yeah. this, huh? We'll give you the credit for that. Damn, we'll give you the I credit thought I was going to be on the leading edge of that absolutely, one. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Well, I'll tell you what, Brent, it's been a pleasure talking with you, and I learned a lot. And hopefully our, our student uh, studio audience has learned a lot. But I want to thank you for your time. And uh, I want to go over and take a look at the Redbird after we finish up. By all days. means. And I'm sure you've seen the Bristol before, but uh, we've got a beauty sitting out there, too. I can't wait to s get that new plane smell again. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, buddy. Yep. Okay. We're going to sign off from this interview. Ben Coleman, one of your many hosts here for uh, the Florida Aviation Network, broadcasting live and in the clear from Sebring Sport Aviation Expo.